Hey guys, welcome to the Beckett Cook Show. I'm Beckett Cook. And as you know, on the show, I like to look at the lies of the culture and try to find the biblical truth behind the lies. And today is no exception. It's a pretty big topic. And the reason I was prompted to even talk about this today was because of an article that came out last week in the New York Times about how Argentina legalized uh, on-demand abortion. So first I want to take a look at the article. Then I want to talk about how my views have changed on abortion and why they changed. And then I want to talk about the biblical support for a pro-life position. And then lastly, I want to talk about the philosophical support for a pro-life position. Um, so let's start with this article. It's a pretty big piece in the New York Times. Of course, you know, I love the New York Times. <laughs> and, and even, you know, when I read the headline of this article, I immediately knew, obviously, that it was celebrating this decision in Argentina. And it has a very celebratory, very um, activist, journalistic kind of tone to it. So just, just the headline alone is how Argentina bucked tradition in Latin America and legalized abortion. Now notice the use of that term bucked, that they bucked tradition. It's almost this kind of like this glorious thing they did, this kind of celebratory thing. And I, of course, immediately knew that the article was going to be praising this decision in Argentina. And the subtitle, in the subtitle it says, that the region in Argentina where Roman Catholic and evangelical ch churches hold sway has long been unfriendly territory for abortion rights activists. So we immediately, there's kind of this pitting of religion against kind of this legal, legalization of abortion. And it gets, it gets more into that later in the article. But uh, this, the caption of this picture that you're seeing here says that Argentina became the largest nation in Latin America to legalize abortion. And you can see from the picture that, you know, there's a huge celebration going on. I mean, I, I remember seeing some of the images of, of that day when it was legalized and there was so much celebration in the streets. And it was, I mean, to be honest, it was confounding. It was, it was bizarre, but, not too bizarre in 2021. So it, the, the article goes on and it's written by Richard Perez Pena. And he says that Latin America has long been hostile terrain for abortion rights advocates. So immediately he kind of begins this article by talking, by using the word hostile. So already he's framing it in a way that is kind of us against them, like abortion rights activists against the religious people or, or pro-life people. So he goes on to say, but a grassroots feminist movement claimed a victory in Argentina on Wednesday when the Senate legalized abortion in a surprisingly resounding vote, making Argentina the first large country in Latin America to take that step. And then he says, he goes on to say, well, why is this happening now? And he says that the women's right movement has taken on new urgency across Latin America in the last few years. And this is the reason he gives for this movement, uh, for, for legalizing abortion, basically. He says, a movement that sprang up in 2015 over the murders of women, including the gruesome killings of a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, grew over the years into a broad national campaign for rights, et cetera, et cetera. And so basically he's saying the movement sprang up over the murder of these teenage girls. So he's basically saying, we're gonna replace one kind of murder with another kind of murder of unborn babies. Um, so it's bizarre that this whole legalization of abortion sprang out of the murder of women and, and teenage girls. So it, there's already just a contradiction going on. Um, and then he says, rising secularism in Argentina 
has lowered the barriers for liberal causes. So again, you know, the secularization of Latin America and uh, has helped this cause, has helped legalize abortion in Argentina. And it, once again, it's the secular versus the sacred versus the religious uh, Christian point of view and worldview. And then he talks about kind of the rest of Latin America from Mexico to Chile. And he, and he gets into Paraguay. He says, Paraguay drew international attention when a pregnant 10-year-old girl said to have been raped by her stepfather could not have an abortion because her life was not in danger. Now, notice how he uses this extreme example to support the legalization of abortion. He uses an example of a stepfather raping his stepdaughter, 10-year-old daughter. And of course, how can you, and, and this is once again, this is just appealing to emotion. Of course, this is a horrendous thing that happened, but it's appealing to emotion to support the obliteration of, of unborn children. And so again, it's just like using this kind of fringe argument of, of rape or incest. It's like a red herring. It's basically a red herring. And uh, he uses that effectively. And then he says, Cuba, ruled by the Communist Party for more than 60 years, legalized abortion in, 1906, in the 1960s. And of course, I mean, when you have a godless worldview, communist worldview, why there's no worth or value or dignity to a human life. So why wouldn't Cuba legalize abortion? It, it makes perfect sense that they would, they would legalize abortion. And then lastly, he goes on to say that President Fernandez of Argentina, as a leftist who made access to abortion one of his top priorities, represents a new generation and a change from his predecessors. You can tell from this article that that um, Richard Pena, P Richard Perez Pena, is is advocating is is an activist. He's advocating abortion in Latin America. He he, you can tell that he wants it to spread across Latin America, and um, so that article wasn't surprising to me, but it did want it did make me want to talk about this issue on the show. So. Let's talk about now, I want to go to how my opinion changed on abortion, because as you guys know, I was saved. I became a Christian 11 years ago, almost well, actually a little over 11 years ago. And before I was a Christian, I was pro-choice. Now, I wasn't adamantly pro-choice. I wasn't a rabid pro-abortion person. But I did, you know, living in Los Angeles, everyone else was pro-choice and, and I just kind of fell into that. You know, I just was like, okay, I guess, yes, I'm pro-choice. I, I think it's up to a woman, it's her body, it's her choice. And I had very one of my best friends uh, who in LA, uh, my, one of my closest, closest friends had had, had an abortion in college and she was very pro-choice, but it was strange because every year she would kind of commemorate or almost celebrate how old her child would have been. So there was almost this kind of birthday every year. And, and even though I was pro-choice, I felt this profound kind of anguish and pain every time she mentioned that. And I think she did as well. And it was just kind of, so I wasn't, I wasn't fully on board, but I, I remember my mother calling me years ago. And as we were talking, she mentioned that my sister was going to a pro-life rally in Dallas, Texas, where I'm from. And I remember her saying to my mo mother, mom, you, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. Tell, tell her not to do that. Like women should have the choice to have an abortion. Like it's it just, it's not up to my sister. It's not up to you. It's up to a woman if she wants to do that. And I remember, you know, basically exhorting my mother over that. And, and then something changed when, when I got saved 11 years ago 
And I understood the Imago Dei, the image of God, that's just Latin for image of God, that human beings are created in the image of God. It was like the lights went on in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit, in my soul. And I was like, oh my gosh, unborn babies are created in the image of God. They're image bearers. So I immediately, immediately became pro-life and I still am. And so I want to talk about the Imago Dei. Like, what is the Imago Dei? Well, first, let's take a look at Genesis chapter one, where it's first mentioned. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And then he goes on to say, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the, the, the earth. And so notice that with the animals, the beasts of the field and et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's according to their kind. Over and over again, we, we, we heard that according to their kind, according to their kind. But once God creates human beings, once he creates man, it, he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So what is that? What is the Imago Dei? What is the image of God? The Imago Dei has been debated since the patri patristic era, since the early church fathers and from Augustine all the way to St. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages to John Calvin in the Reformation. It's been debated what exactly the image of God is, but roughly it's, it's we reflect as human beings, we not only are rational thinking creatures, but we reflect God's moral character and his righteous character. Now, the, a lot of that was damaged and marred in the fall, in the fall of mankind, that image was was broken, but we still retain the image of God. The image of God was defaced, but not erased. And so we still, it's kind of like if you think of a broken windshield, the, the windshield is broken, but it's still functioning. So it still, you know, protects you from the wind and, and it still protects you from rain, etc. So are we are yes are the image of god in human beings has been marred but it is still there and we still have that stamp of god on us and of course in the you know in the new creation new heavens and new earth if you're in christ that image will be re completely restored the image of god so that's something to look forward to and so anyway the the, the imago day is we have the ability for self-reflection, we have we have the, the the idea of justice. We we yearn for justice because God is a God of justice. God is love, and we have the ability to love. Um, we also, unlike animals, we have we're the only creatures who have the ability to be in relationship with God. If you are a Christian, you are in a relationship with God. No animal can do that. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith defines the Imago Dei as this. He, it says, he created man, God created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after his own image. And if we go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 through 6, God is speaking to Noah after the flood, and he says, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. And this is important. Verse six, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. So again, I mean, this is reiterated throughout the Bible that we're created in God's image. Therefore, we have human value. We have human worth. We have dignity. We have a soul and our life is sacred and even the life of the unborn is sacred. So I wanna look at some, a couple powerful biblical passages that support the pro-life position. And 
uh, of course, there there are many passages that that do, but I just want to focus on a couple number, actually three. The first one is <clears throat> Psalm 139. This is kind of the most famous passage that supports life in the womb. And it says for, this is Psalm 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. So see, God is actively knitting a human being in the mother's womb. So the, the, that, that is life. That's life in the womb. And in Isaiah 44, verse 24, it says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. Again, the Bible goes straight to the womb and makes it really clear that, that God is, is creating life in the womb. That, that is human life. And it, and it has the Imago Dei stamped on it. So, and then the last, the last passage is, is in Exodus 21, Yahweh, God, is giving the law to Moses at Sinai. And he says, he talks about two men getting in a brawl, into a brawl and fighting. And he basically says, if these two men fight and accidentally hit a pregnant woman and the woman has a miscarriage, then you shall pay life for life. So in other words, that life in the womb is a life, according to Yahweh, according to God. So that's that's another example of a biblical support for pro-life, the pro-life position. And, and now I want to look at kind of the philosophical reasons why we can support a pro-life position. And you don't even need to really... In this, the, in this philosophical understanding, you don't need necessarily the Bible. But I'm going to first talk about, you know, our dignity and our worth because of, of what the Bible says about us. But then go on to kind of give you the secular philosophical understanding of this. And so if we are made in God, I've, I've said this before, if we're made in God's image, we have dignity, we have value, we have worth. Science, there is no scientific basis for this. Scientific naturalism or secular humanism cannot give a human being value or worth. So a secular humanist, someone who, like Richard Perez Pena, I'm assuming he's a secular humanist, he cannot object to the idea of sex trafficking or slavery or racism or torturing babies for the fun of it like you can't there's no way to object to that if you have this if you believe that human beings are just a collocation of atoms that were are, are a result of an evolutionary process of natural selection and random mutation and that we just evolved from primordial soup then there is no basis for human beings having human rights, having di dignity and worth. So uh, the secular humanists or the, the scientific naturalists want to have their cake and eat it too <laughs> when it's convenient for them. The way secular humanists get around this is they ground human worth and dignity in human capacity. And so they say that the, that the unborn fetus in the womb has doesn't have the capacity for rational thought, for language, etc. But a newborn infant doesn't either. So that doesn't even make sense. Also, what about someone in a comatose state? They don't have the capacity for rational thought or for language, etc. So what do we do? Do we kill people who are in a comatose state or do we kill the elderly who are, I mean, my mother had Alzheimer's for the last at least 10 years of her life. I mean, do we just kill her because she doesn't have the capacity for rational thought and for a rational functioning mind? And so that, that argument doesn't work. And we know she, embryos have all the DNA of a human being. 
If you leave an embryo in the womb, if you leave it alone, and of course, assuming that the mother's eating nutritious food and having drinking water, that embryo will develop into a human being, a mature human being. Not that embryo will not become a cat or a dog. <laughs> so or a pet lizard like that embryo will form into a human being so left alone i mean assuming there's no miscarriage etc um, human embryos develop into human beings and that's obvious is just an obvious fact the unborn are persons with potential they're not potential persons so they I mean, that's just again human beings, human embryos turn into human beings. And also there's, you know, some, there's a disease, I, I forgot what it's called, but some people are born with half a brain or a partial brain. But does that make them half a person? No, they're still a full person, but they have half a brain. Or even someone who has brain damage after an accident, you know, are they half, are they less of a per 90% of a person or 60%? No, they're still a hundred percent of a person. So our moral value depends on the kind of thing we are, i.e. a human being, not on what we're able to do. Um, and then of course, you know, a lot of people argue, could, people might object to me talking about abortion because I'm a man. And I just want to point out, and that, that's a common argument, men shouldn't be able to talk about abortion, it's a women. But I just want to point out that Roe v. Wade was decided by nine men on the Supreme Court. It was a 7-2 decision in 1973, and it became the law, uh, uh, abortion on demand became the law of the land. And so men made that decision. So I just want to close with this. There have been 61 million abortions, roughly, in the U.S. since Roe v. Wade, since 1973. In the year 2020 alone, worldwide, there were 42, there, the estimates are, are, are somewhere between 42 million to 73 million abortions just in one year. And the way I look at this, you know, we kind of look at antiquity and and kind of uh, we look, look down upon people in antiquity when they would offer sacrifices of, of, un of babies, basically, to different gods, fertility gods or the sun god, or et cetera, in the Greco-Roman world. But we do the exact same thing as a culture, as a society. We sacrifice babies, unborn babies, on the altar of either convenience, and or on the altar of sexual liberation. And so we're no different from the, the barbaric Greco-Roman world where all of this was going on. And there, there's a, a Planned Parenthood building right near me. Actually, I actually drive by it every day, almost every day. And it's in West Hollywood on San Vicente, and it's like a five to six story building. And, you know, before I was, it's been there for a long time, since the 90s at least. But before I would drive by it, I literally wouldn't even think anything of it. I had, you know, just, I just thought of it as, oh, there's Planned Parenthood. But now I drive by it, and every time I drive by it, it's crazy. I mean, I think of the, utter carnage that's going on inside that building and i think i actually i mean my heart sinks every time i drive by it i i think of i literally think of like screaming crying babies and it's it's horrible it's it, it's the worst feeling every time i need to stop driving by that building but um and by the way i just want you to know i just want to make this clear that if I mean I've had very close friends who have come to Christ and and they had abortions in the in in the past and God forgives you if you repent of that and you confess those sins God forgives you of that and as and as in Psalm one hundred three it says he he doesn't even remember it as far as from the east is from the west those sins are completely that that's gone 
It's that's there's no condemnation in Christ, as you know. So I just want to make that clear. So I just want to you guys to pray for Argentina. I, you know, I think of the musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber, don't, you know, Avita, and where she says, don't, Avita says, don't cry for me, Argentina, and her, in that song, the musical. And I just think of, we need to cry for Argentina, and we need to pray for Argentina. So I know this was a heavy episode, and, and guys, I thank you for, for watching. I'm probably going to talk about this issue a lot more in different and different episodes in the future, but that's all I have for today. Thank you for watching. Please share this, like it, subscribe, and I will see you next week on the Becca Cook Show. Next week is gonna be a really fun, interesting episode, you'll see, but um, be sure to watch that too. So I'll see you next time on the Becca Cook Show. Thank you.